Thank you, Sister Yiling, for reading the long passage for us. Let's do a quick recap of what happened last week. So Moses urged God's people, the Israelites, not to forget God. Remember, there was a forget-me-not thing. And, but to humbly obey His word to guide them against the prideful heart, the heart that was so prone to self-reliance, taking things in their own hand, the self-focus, which is just focus on what I want, what I need right now, right here, the bread, you know, and the manna and all. And self-glorifying, thinking that they have done all this by their own hand. You know, so this action of God bringing them through the 40 years in the wilderness was to humble them and to test the Israelites in the very harsh, condi- harsh condition of the wilderness. And at the same time, God so graciously provided for them the food that they do not know of, remember that, and water, and they could not do any of these things for themselves in the wilderness. It's really to humble them. This is God's loving discipline for His people in the wilderness, like a father disciplining his child, you know, and dealing with that, that heart of the child, which is so self-reliant, so self-focused. And then God also told them, when you are in the land, when you have a good time, when things are stable and you experience some success, Moses warned them that you also have to guard this self-glorifying heart. So this is what happened last week. Because it's so easy to forget God when things are bad, we begin to focus on ourselves. You know, or when things are good, when we experience some success, it's also easy to forget God. Why? Well, because... Human beings are just basically forgetful creatures, right? We are very forgetful people. And believers, after we become Christians, and there's no difference, no difference, we constantly experience this thing I call spiritual amnesia. You know, so you always forget things, amnesia, but it's a spiritual type of amnesia. And so today's passage, Israel was again warned not to forget something. But it's not God. You know, it's not to forget. This time around, it's not God that they are not supposed to forget. They are not, so, they are not supposed to forget about themselves. You know, they, are not to, they are supposed to avoid this thing called the spiritual amnesia. Okay, let's pray as we dive into today's passage in chapter 9. Father, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your spirit to energize us this afternoon and open our eyes, Lord, as we open up. Deuteronomy chapter 9 to read and to understand and to hear from you. We also pray, O oh God, that you open our hearts to embrace this truth as convictions. We can't do this for ourselves. We can't add growth to anyone here. We can't convert any soul. We pray for your gracious work of the Holy Spirit upon us this afternoon. Not just us, but with the children, with the CF. This we humbly pray before you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So I put verse 1 to verse 3 as the outline as a glorious future. So verse 1 and verse 2, verse 2, you take a look at it. God actually reminded, or wrong, Moses reminded the Israelites that they will be facing a formidable enemies, you know, the Canaanites. And they will be so numerous, it's hard for them to fight. And their cities are still fortified up to heaven. You know, and there are even then among them, some groups of them are known as Anakins which are the giants, big and tall fellows, you know, and they're so famous that people say, who will fight them? Who will fight the sons of Anak? You know, and so in verse 3, Moses assured the Israelites of success. They're going to experience this thing called a glorious future. They're going to be successful. They're going to have victory, you know, and why and how do they experience this victory against a numerous enemy, well-protected, and giant. Verse 3 tells us, because the Lord is crossing before you. He will destroy the enemy. No matter how many are there, no matter how strong they are, God is going to subdue them. Verse 4 says, God in fact going to drive them out and dispossess them. That means he's going to kick them out, put Israelites into the land. You know, why would the Lord fight for Israel? Why would the Lord give this good land to the Israelites? Verse 5 tells us, well, because He has promised it to Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob. Who are these three persons? Who is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, of course, these are the forefathers of this whole entire nation. But do not make a mistake here and think that therefore, this victory is a nationalistic thing. It's an Israel nation thing. Neither should we make a mistake and think that this victory is a racial thing. It is for the Jew, Jewish stuff that we are talking about here. You know, you must understand this. I, and I put a picture here. You know, the victory is because of God's faithfulness to His promise. And this is nothing to do with na their nation or their race. Okay, so what God is doing with this particular nation in the Old Testament is what God is going to do. In fact, this promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can actually trace it back. You take a look at here. So, oh, the picture, okay, this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what we're talking about. This is, we actually trace back this promise all the way to Genesis 12, 26, and 28. But this promise actually can trace even uh, 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 backward further, furthermore. You know, to actually, this is the same covenant that was extended to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant with Noah himself in Genesis chapter 9. But even Noah's covenant, we can still trace further back. You know, if you see, it was actually the same covenant that was extended to Noah, the further extent to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, was the same covenant for Adam and Eve. At the point when God passed judgment on them, God also made a covenant or a promise to them that the offspring of Eve, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, the offspring of Eve were crushed the head of the serpent, which is Satan himself. This promise or this covenant is a victory over Satan and reverse the curse of sin for men. So this victory is not merely a nationalistic, nationalistic thing or a racial thing for Israel alone. This is what God would do to all nations who have the same faith or possess the same faith as Abraham Isaac and Jacob. You know, and the climax of this victory, this uh, diagram is not ended yet, the, the climax of this victory, of course, is at the cross itself. And the climax of this victory is when at the cross and the empty tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ, when He came out from the empty tomb, He decisively destroys Satan and sin and death. He reversed the curse of sin. You know, the climax of the victory over Satan, sin, and death is God's faithful promise in the person, accomplished in the person of His own Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, this is not this promise here to possess the land is just a physical thing to show what God ultimately will do. God will fight for them. Because, and God will give them this land is because of His faithfulness to keep this promise all the way and uh, Israelites are just ex part of this, experiencing this, you know, all the way when, until Jesus Christ is here. So God will fight for them. And what will be the response of Israelites? Do they just sit there and do nothing and wait? Yeah, God will fight. So don't have to, even to carry arms. Is it true? No. Take a look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, well, where God will drive them out, you will drive the enemies out and destroy them. So I put here, you know, while God will fight for His people, they will work in cooperation with God, in faith, trusting in His promise, and in obedience to go in and dispossess them, to deliver them out. You know, it is like, what is this like? It is like, Esther recently uh, baked a cake, you know, and she got Joan to involve you know, Joan, how old she, she is, right? She's only eight and all this. So Joan was all excited. But Esther is the one who bought all the ingredients, prepared all the ingredients for baking. Then Joan, in all her excitement to help, Esther guide her step by step. You know, and so the baking was successful, not because Joan baked the, uh, beat the egg, uh, eggs. She did. She did, but it was guided by Esther. She put this here, okay, you beat like that. Okay, not too hard, not too hard. All the eggs will come out. She said, no, 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 no. So slowly. 
you know, and step by step, they say, okay, weigh this ingredient, weigh the, the flour, weigh the sugar, everything. And the, the cake was successful, not because Joan weighed all this, because it was, because Esther was guiding her step by step from ingredient preparation, buying them, preparing them, all the way to the procedure, to the, the temperature of the oven, the timing of the, the baking and all. So Esther was behind all these, but Joan was enjoying the process to see all the, the successful product of the cake itself. You know, and, but of course, the thing is, uh, Esther bought a, a big uh, cheesecake for my birthday. Then after finished baking, Joan said, but Papa like uh, carrot cake. Why you bake cheesecake? <laughs> okay, that's besides the point. Okay, <laughs> so in this case, in a similar way, God will fight and drive out and dispossess the land. But Israel must act in faith to God's word and in obedience, you know, to see so in order to see and taste the final success and glory, you know. So, and in the same way for us. In the same way for us as Christians, we will fight sins and temptation. We will fight Satan by intruding into his territory and bring the gospel to those who are unsafe. You know, and if there's any success, you know, it's not be, um, like any success is against sin and temptation. Like you become less hot-tempered, you overcome addiction of some kind, you are more loving, you understand the Bible a bit more. Or some souls are saved as a result of you sharing gospel. Or some, uh, uh, some people grow in maturity as a result of you reading the Bible with them. You know, it's some kind of success that we, 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 we experience. It's, we are actually more like Joan in my illustration. We weigh, we beat the egg. We, right, but what we do is we trust the guidance of someone higher and we obey the instructions like Joan obeying the instructions of the mother, you know. So where God lovingly and graciously prepared us to work and work through us, and he, he, but he was there all this while fighting for us. This is like a verse in the New Testament that says this. He says, therefore, my be beloved, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is an Old Testament word, with fear and trembling. It's an Exodus and Deuteronomy word. You know, for God... It is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Yes, God will fight for them, will win the victory for them, but Israel work in cooperation with God in faith and obedience. So He work out their salvation with fear and trembling. It is like the song that we just sang. Today I'm a bit more poetic, so I'll just quote the song for you. It says, To this I hope my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won. The vectors uh, have been won. And I shall overcome. But yes, it's not I. It is Christ in me. It's through, through Christ in me. And to this I hope my sins have been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All the chains are released. Some addiction are released. Some, some souls are saved. I can sing. I am free. Yet not I. It's through Christ in me. You know, so the first portion here, verse 1, 3. God promised victory based on His power to overcome and His faithfulness. And believers are to cooperate with Him in acting in faith, by acting in faith, in and obedience to his word. So, and humbly depend, of course, on the Holy Spirit, which is you know, not in this passage, but we know we have to depend on the Holy Spirit. But there's a problem here. The problem is this. Believers always experience spiritual amnesia. When we experience success or victory, we forget about ourselves. Last week, we saw that in bad time or in good time, we tend to forget God. And today, we see that we will forget ourselves, just like Israelites forget about them, forget something about themselves. And what is it that will, they will forget? I put here the, for the rest of the passage here, verse 4 to 29, the inglorious past. The inglorious past. 
as much as God promised a glorious future for them, they need to remember their inglorious past. And they, for, they will tend to forget. You know, Israel warned, was warned not to forget about their past when they face the success in the future. Verse 7, he says, remember, don't forget. It's the same word used in chapter 8. It was remember and don't forget. It's the same terms used there. They are supposed to remember their dirty past. After experiencing victory, Israel would tend to think too highly of themselves. They would tend to think too highly of themselves. And that's why God has to repeat three times and say, it is not your righteousness. It is not because of your uprightness of heart. Verse 6, it says, it is not because of your righteousness. Three times, God has to remind them and he has to te tease out the whole entire history from verse 8 all the way to 29. The Lord has to, the Lord has, through Moses, has to remind them of their inglorious past. What did they do? Well, I just summarized the whole passage for us. 8 to 21, they fell in uh, uh, idolatry where Moses was up in Horeb or Sinai and were collecting the Ten Commandments. They were happily enjoying worshipping that golden calf. Remember that incident? 8 to 21. Then 22 to 29, when they were at the foot or the, at the entrance of the land of Canaan to the south, when God says, go in and take the land, they refused to go in. They were acting in disbelief, distrust. They said, God wants to send us to die or what? So they distrust God and disobedience. You can see that in verse 23. And how did God actually describe them, these people? Three times he says, these are stubborn people, not willing to obey. This is what stubbornness really means. And they are rebellious people. They will rebel against God's command and willfully turn away from God. And in fact, they will turn very quickly. You can see verse 12 says, they, they are so quickly turning away from God. Verse 12. And verse 16, uh, Moses himself says, when he came now, he saw how quickly they turn to the golden calf. They are so sweet. We are like them. We are so swift to turn away from God. We are so swift to turn to idolatry. We are so swift to turn to sin. What shall we call ourselves? The Swifties. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, for those, the fan of uh, Taylor Swift, sorry. And in all our actions, they will provoke God to anger again and again and again, verse 7, verse 8, verse 18, verse 19, verse 22, they provoke God to anger again and again. And if you remember uh, Exodus 34, it was said about God that He's slow to anger and abounding in love. And to provoke a God who is slow to anger, Israel must really, really be stubborn, rebellious, and quick to turn away from God. Again and again, repeatedly. No. So Israel has their inglorious past, a dirty, ugly history. And that's why God has to remind them not to forget their past and to start to think too highly of themselves when they started to taste a little bit of history, uh, success and victory. Their victory is not because God was... Not be, it's not because of them. Their victory is because God was powerful. Verse 3 say, their victory was because of God's power to drive these people out. And their victory was because God decided to be faithful, uh, to show this faithfulness to them, to show this grace for them for salvation, to deliver them. Verse 5 says, and their victory, twice it says, not because of them, but it's because of the enemy's wickedness. So God decided to move in for judgment because of the weakness of the people of Canaan. You know, it's not because of Israel's righteousness. So, I summarize here, I just put here, that believers really, really have no reason for self-righteousness. Israel has their inglorious past, a dirty, ugly history. We too, all of us here, if we are honest, we have our ugly past and dirty history. 
we have no reason, like the Israelites, for self-righteousness. We are, if we are honest, we will know that we are very quick to turn to idolatry. Money, career, praise of men, pleasures of all kinds. We are so swift to rebel against God's word, so stubborn to turn in repentance. We may be repeating our sins and idolatry multiple times. And we may have been provoking God to anger many times, just like the Israelites. So believers have no reason for self-righteousness. Well, we will pause here for a while to think about some implications. If we have our own inglorious past and there's no place for self-righteousness, what does it mean for us? Well, I think there are a few things we can think about. One is to be humble, to reflect on our inglorious past. And don't always focus on our victories or so-called successes in ministry or in our life, in our understanding. Don't, don't just focus, merely focus on all these things. It's good time for us also sometimes to reflect on what we were like and what God, how God has brought us to where we are today. You know, so to be humble, to reflect sometimes on our inglorious past. But at the same time, because we have our own uh, inglorious past, some of us have grown over the years as Christians, you know, we should also look at sinners in the same way. We should welcome all kinds of sinners into our midst. They will come and join us. They are different from us in a sense that they, they, some of them do not know Jesus yet. Some of them don't have a good knowledge of the Bible. Some of them still behave in a certain way. You know, so we should welcome all kinds of sinners into our midst so that they can come and see the love of God, taste the love of God, hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and turn in repentance and faith. Lastly, because we have our own inglorious past, we should learn to forgive others who had wronged us. People also have their inglorious past. And in, like ourselves, in our own ugly past, we have, probably have sinned against other people. You know, maybe because of that, it is good to reflect on our own inglorious past and learn to forgive people who have sinned against us, who have wronged us, rightly or wrongly, whether reasonable or not reasonable. Because when we sin against God, it was never reasonable ourselves. Some sitting here may not like to hear this. You may be thinking, well, are you advocating this self-defeating theology? Keep beating ourselves up and self-inflicting ourselves, whipping ourselves. It's kind of self-punishment gospel of works. You know, well, it would sound like that if, if, Moses didn't remind Israel of something very important in the past history. And in fact, he repeats a few times. So take a look at the passage. Moses described how when he came down from Sinai, he was so furious, he smashed the two tablets, and God was angry with them, and God would destroy the Israelites. But immediately, Moses described this. In verse 18, he says, he interceded for them 40 days and 40 nights. Then he stood up, he looked at Aaron, the high priest who's supposed to lead them to God, lead them to the golden calf. And God was so angry with Aaron to destroy him. At verse 20, Moses on his knees again and prayed for Aaron. Then he continued to describe when at Kadesh Barnea, when Israel refused to enter the land, again at verse 25, which is the third time Moses prayed for the Israelites. 40 days, 40 nights. And he pleaded with God based on God's covenant. 
God, remember your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That's what he pleaded, pleaded with God. And Moses was so concerned also for the glory of God, if you take a look at the last part of it, that other nations may think badly of God. They will think that God is not able to bring the Israelites into the land. That's why he went get rid of them. You know, verse 28. Or God actually hate these Israelites. His intention, God's intention is actually questionable. Also verse 28. So, but then God in that case, in, in this case, listened to Moses and showed mercy again and again to Israel, to Aaron. So today, when we think of our own inglorious past, our dirty history, ugly history, when we reflect on our own sinfulness and rebellion, it is not a self-beating theology or doctrine. Rather, it is for us to place our confidence in the correct place. Our, if our confidence is placed on ourselves, then will be self-righteousness. If we can say things like, oh, I, I, I've improved what? Last time I was very hot-tempered, but now I've improved what? No, we, then it is self-righteousness. Or our confidence could be placed in us. I start doing this, like the, the, uh, the, the passage that uh, Elder Jonas read for us for the pastoral reading. He said, I've started giving money, offering, I've started praying, to, i start fasting, I've done, I've done all these good works, I've been for mission trip to some far, far away countries that nobody wants to go. I've done all this. When we glory ourselves in all this, it is still gospel of works, self righteousness. But if our confidence is rest, in the perfect high priest who lives to intercede for us, our Lord Jesus Christ, then reflecting on our inglorious past is actually good for us that we begin to place our confidence not in ourselves, but in the perfect high priest who intercedes for us. You know, and the verse says here, Hebrews 7.25, it is consequently he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. He prays for them. He intercedes for them. When we remember our inglorious past, we do feel ashamed, rightly so, natural, but instead of self-beating and just remain feeling guilty, remorseful, we should place our faith, our confidence in the real high priest, not Aaron, because he failed, but in our Lord Jesus Christ, who took our sin to the cross on our behalf. And after resurrection and ascension into heaven, now sits at God's right hand, he prays for us. He lives to pray for us. That's what this verse says. Hebrews 7 says, he prays for us. So you can imagine the a uh, heavenly court scene. You know, yeah, God is seated there, Christ is at the right side, and Satan came around in the heavenly court scene. Just like in the case of Job, remember? He came and accused Job of it, came around, and he joined the rest of people, and he looked at the Christians in Tong Chai Presbyterian, English Presbyterian Church. And he says, look at that. Look at that guy. God, that one your believer. Ah. He did it again. Look at her. She lost her temper again. Look at that one. She gossiped again. These are your people? She will be accusing the Christians, the brothers, one by one. Then, someone at the right hand of God stood up and says, for that sin, I paid it on the cross. For that sin, I paid it on the cross. And he continues to intercede for us and pray for us and speak up to God on our behalf. And Jesus who says, yes, for your glory, Father, help these poor sinners, help that weak one, to stand on their feet again. This is what Jesus will do for us. He will pray for us. 
So when we reflect on our sinful and rebellious past, our inglorious past, it is not to beat ourselves down doctrines, rather it is to place our confidence at the correct person, not ourselves, Jesus Christ. Just like this hymn says, oh, I, I tell you, I'm a bit poetic today, I'll quote to you. <laughs> yeah. So when Satan tempts me to despair, looking at my inglorious past, I was like, Ay, why did I do this? Why did I say that? Why did I practice this? Why did I go there? Tell me of all the guilt within. Where should we place our confidence? He says, I look up and see him there, the one who sits at the right hand of God, who make an end to all my sins because a sinless Savior died for us. We all have our past. A sinless Savior died for us. My sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Shall we pray together? We are filled with guilt and a long history of inglorious past. Even now, we thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. We thank you, Jesus, for praying for us. And Jesus, we thank you for loving us and never give up on us. Help us to place our confidence in you and you alone. Help us boast, boast in you and boast at the cross, about the cross and not about ourselves. For your glory's sake, we pray. Amen.